Hey, it's Dr. Alex G. You know, we have so many new patrons and we have so many new listeners that we have to actually drop some older episodes just to let people know how we got here. And so this episode today is one of those redrops. It's entitled White Savior or White Ally. And this is when Tyler, my state, my um, podcast manager and one of my associate pastors, and I had a very deep discussion based upon Jeff Groat's um, conversation with me. Like, how do I know when I'm being an ally and how do I know when I have a savior, a messiah complex? So this is one of our um, most popular episodes because I think it's scratched where many of our white allies are itching. So you're going to want to take notes on this. You're going to want to repost this, tell people about it. When our listeners get excited about an episode and share, that's when we get lots of new listeners. And also, when you get a chance, go to iTunes or wherever you find this podcast, write um, a review for a brother. Write a review, because if I get a couple of hundred of you doing that, that will help us so much move up in the optimization process so that more people can find us more easily. Enjoy this episode. It's going to rock you. And as always, lean in, listen, learn. And be transformed by what you hear. Become a part of the change you want to see. Hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Has anyone ever asked could they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world black through the perspective like of me. one black man. One conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. Welcome to another exciting episode of Black Like Me. And I know my voice is a little um, deeper. I'm sounding sort of um, Isaac Hayes-ish right now with his low voice. But I'm on the good end of a, of, a, of a head cold, but I'm excited about being here in the studio and, and recording this episode. So thanks for bearing with, with my weird voice, but I wanted to be with you all today. You know, every once in a while, I like to bring people who've been in the background and who helped to make the podcast work to come to the microphone and just, you know, just help me process the things that I'm thinking about. And so you all know Tyler. He's been my uh, podcast manager for 70 episodes. He's been here right from, from the start. And it was actually right there as I began to develop the concept for this. And so we want to really just talk about a couple of comments, emails, tweets that we've been getting from listeners. And so, um, Tyler, welcome back to Black Like Me. Thank you, thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> uh, it's also good I'm a survivor this morning because in the middle of... You know, you're uh, not feeling as well. I may have took a sip accidentally from uh, your cup of tea this morning and didn't, I don't think I contracted a Blackness? cold or, not black, uh, no, I, a cold. So what you all, you. so Tyler and I have standing meetings and we moved so that we could be closer to an outlet so we could charge up Tyler's computer because he doesn't My charge computer. it because he doesn't charge his stuff up was mine the one on one person you know what that? Tyler um and so <laughs> Tyler reaches for a cup and if anyone, I'm I'm a germaphobe, so I don't like drinking behind my kid, my wife, my mama, any any folks. And so if I had to lead a church where we drank out of a, a single unity cup, I probably would have to change religions. Yep. And so, or at least denominations. And so Tyler grabbed <laughs> grabbed my cup and he drank it. And he had this, oh shit, look in his <laughs> eyes. And so Tyler, I know I have a bit of a cough, but were you worried about that or were, were you worried about becoming black? I was worried about neither at that moment. Okay, uh, all right. The, uh, my specific huh. worry is I do know that you have a uh, propensity to not like germs or gross or I don't like saliva. Like I can deal with James, but, uh, germs, but so I, I forgot that you were sick. And I was more I was more concerned <laughs> yeah. that you were just going to be like slap me for drinking your cup and then being like I can't oh. drink this again. You go buy me another thing. So, Man, yeah. that was so okay. So that shock in your eyes. Yeah. Was okay. Was not because of the the uh, that you might all of a sudden start growing a fro, no. or um, clapping on beat or anything. I don't think so. No, that wasn't. I don't think that was it. <laughs> oh man, that was really good. That's really good. So Tyler, you haven't been on this side of the microphone or in this particular studio with me. Usually, you're on the other side of the glass. Yep. You know, telling me I'm out of time or or, or something <laughs> like that, or saying push Patreon, push Patreon. Um, which is a good thing. I'm glad you pushed me to push Patreon. But, uh, man, I really do appreciate you coming on here. I don't think people realize this, but but Tyler is about, can I say your age? Yeah. 27. We met when you were 22. 
Mm-hmm. I think you had just started grad school. Mm-hmm. And so um, we actually met in a class that was talking about race. We were having discussions about about race and ethnicity. And it's so interesting that you fast forward. Um, we're still working together to help people have these conversations and not just have the conversations, but but move into um, space of solutions and togetherness and um, fruitful, mutually beneficial outcomes. And so we do this in the faith circles. We've done it at a conference. You and I spoke at, um, was it a white privilege? Con- yeah, it was a white privilege conference yeah. um, in Northern Wisconsin. And then we get to talk about this uh, a little bit here on, on the show. So, so is it all right if we just have, yeah. um, you know, have a little dialogue? Um, what, first of all, let me just ask, did, was your summer good? Yeah, last summer was yeah. real good. Because, you know, you're always in the studio, except when you're off doing white things, um, or off being white. And like so what? this I don't know, vacationing? You, you saw pictures of me at the Apple Orchard recently. Yeah, I saw, <laughs> yes, I saw that. And um, um, I like picking apples, so I'm not going to let white people have that. Because <laughs> um, we used to do that for y'all. And um, <laughs> uh, but at the baseball games with your dad, you know that was yeah. no, that, that was good. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call that white. That was fun to see you and your father. Yeah, for those who don't know, I took uh, my dad and I took a trip all along the East Coast. We went to yeah, that was uh, cool. Seven different stadiums and in, uh, in the Hall of Fame in eight days. Uh, we've been wanting to do that since I was about 12. So that was a good time to be no, able to that's, do that with my dad. that's, and I'm glad you posted about it because one, it reminds dads that their adult sons and adult children still want to do things together. Yeah. yeah. So I just think that's really, I think that was really cool. So I'm glad you had a, you know, had a, had a good time. Um, sometimes people criticize me for making fun of white people <laughs> on the show. Some of my best friends are white. So why, you know, I don't even see color. So I don't even know how they would think I'd make fun of, uh, of white people, but Hey, we're going to talk about a couple of um, um, messages that we've gotten sure. and people give us good feedback a lot. We get some not so good feedback, but mainly it's, it's good feedback. And one message is from an African-American um, listener. And then we're going to refer to one that's a, that's a white listener. And, and the one from the black listener is more of a, of a statement that I want us to, to address or to comment on. And then after a few minutes, talk about the question that was posed by one of, one of our listeners. But I found out that this, the listener who made this comment is also a national recording artist, you know, and, uh, yeah, an award nominated recording artist. And so um, I'm just going to play a little bit of his most recent single before I come back and read his comment. <laughs> So this gentleman's name is, I don't think he'll mind me mentioning his first name because it's just a good comment. And it looks like he posted it somewhere. Marquis. He says in commenting about this, particularly after listening to the Robin D'Angelo interview about um, white woman's tears and white fragility. That's um, season three, episode 57. He said, Dr. Alexander G in his podcast series does an excellent job in offering white people an opportunity to learn blackness. And he says in quotes in the closet, so to speak. This is a biblical reference. Um, The Nicodemus pathway is what he calls it. Someone who came to Jesus by night. But it's clearly easy to be a white person in America and succeed at practically anything without understanding blackness or its priceless contribution to the coveted promise of being a United States citizen. Dr. G gives you, white America, a gateway to become a better American and unavoidably a better human. That's a real powerful statement. Yeah, it is. Um, and it doesn't just say that this is a feel-good show, and it doesn't just say here's an angry black man who's yelling at at white people. But he 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 makes this observation that it is easy to be successful at anything for white people in America without understanding not only the contributions but the pain and struggles of African American people. Do you think that's true, Tyler? In your world, do you do you can you attest 
that there may be that there are some white people who might not know about the contributions or even some of the real struggles for African Americans that may continue to this day in America. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why we do the Black History course, and that's why every time we do the Black History course, with um, th- it could be you know CEO level people, it could be people from all across we judges, judges, this, this, that you know, we got people from any any level really that come in, and pretty much all across the board. It's sure. It's, I never knew this. Same same with almost any yeah white person who comes through different elements like that. It's just we've we've never known this, and so uh, yeah, you really. You, you don't have to know or be, um, yeah, aware of any of those things necessarily to succeed in the U.S. at this point uh, as a white individual in the U.S. So, You know, I, I've talked to a few people. I, I was actually a guest on a podcast recently, and um, it was a white host, and he says, w- my friends want to know, basically, where do, you, where do we go to meet black people? And so for many whites, they don't understand why we don't all live in the same neighborhoods. And it could, it, it could be assumed that black people don't want to live by white people, that we just decided that we want to live in some other kinds of communities. And so to Marquis's point, people also are oblivious to the history that with redlining and and other um, social restrictions, it was designed that blacks and whites not live together. We now have inherited this reality and people are still trying to figure out but why don't our kids go to the same schools? Why don't they play on the same athletic teams? Why don't they know each other? Why don't they sit together at lunchtime and they're not aware of the contributions or the strategies that were put in place by the U.S. government, by churches, by social organizations to really keep the races mm-hmm. apart? And so I just, I, you know, I, I love it when people talk back to us and give us, give us their insights. But he says, he says something that I think really is true about the podcast, how it allows white people to learn in the closet, mm-hmm. which means they don't have to. And I'm not saying that this should always be the case, but upon initially finding this podcast, they're able to really listen in on conversations like this one right here, or whether it's something with Jerome Dillard or Eddie Moore or some of the other, you know, the many people that uh, Eddie Moore Jr. people that we've interviewed. It gives them a chance to listen in without being afraid of asking poor questions or insensitive questions. Yeah. And um, I just think it's such a great description of of why podcast is such a powerful medium yeah and, and it's much more of an intro point for people i mean a lot of people right. this really is one of their first experiences possibly um being able to hear genuine discussion uh that's not filtered that's not coming through a specific lens that's not involving anything else it's, it, it's an intro point much like he points i know it's a biblical example but with nicodemus he comes at night right. talks to jesus it's his intro point of saying what what, what do you actually think right what do you actually mean because and i, I don't want talk, my friends to know i'm talking I don't, to you yeah i don't want uh, no one else knows necessarily that i'm here or uh, i don't want to be embarrassed and like looking you know be asking sure. these specific questions in front of anybody else but what what is it actually what, what do you actually think sure so you know uh, um uh, another uh, uh, this is I read this point earlier, but I want to um, just underscore it that uh, Marquis says that this show, this this podcast gives white America a gateway to becoming a better American. That's um, that's fairly I mean, that's really prolific mm-hmm. because um, understanding race relations tends to be tangential to someone's life or mm-hmm. social life. That if I meet some people that look different from me, I'll interact with them. I'm not going to not hire someone. I'm not going to avoid someone who doesn't look like me. But he's tied it into becoming a better American. And so it's like if I get around to it, I'll do it. But he's saying, how can we really be good Americans if we don't understand how we're better when everyone's playing a part or has a role? And so he's couching this in a way that says it's not just good for people who just want to be good individuals. This is important stuff for people who want to live out what it really means to be good Americans. That's that's powerful language. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think what Mark was just saying is so important because the two are not always seen as being the two concepts of being racially inclusive or, 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 or really being open to building cross cultural relationships and being a good American. Those two are not always mutually inclusive. I mean, some of the folks who are fighting to be good Americans feel that people of color are keeping America from being great and keeping the economy from being great, therefore keeping them from being great. Mm -hmm. He's saying that listening to the show and understanding race relations is an entry point into becoming better Americans. What we're seeing is that the current call or very popular call to be true Americans often looks like demeaning the contributions of others, putting them down, 
promoting stereotypes about them. So what he's saying really flies into the face of of a movement that I really see happening, particularly um, uh, among a certain group of young white men who feel that it's their right to take America yeah, back. Absolutely. So I just want to say, um, Marcos, keep listening. Hey, I'm glad we got a you know to, we got a chance to play a little segment of your newest song. It's called Moving, and it really is moving. It's a it's a real moving piece. But um, thank you for listening. And so. Yeah, keep keep sharing it with your friends, Marquis. Keep making those comments and to others who are who are listening to us. Um, don't just keep this to yourselves. I'm hoping that each episode will will not only allow you to think about the issues yourself, but think about the people who could also be touched by the discussion. And so one of the greatest thing that you can do is to have to share this information because I believe that once people's hearts and their heads have been connected, they start looking for opportunities for solutions and not just excuses to, to not be, to not be connected. Yeah. And, and again, I just got to underscore this. We, we can't promote good Americanism, good citizenship. Um, if everyone we know and everyone we interact with looks just like us and we feel that anyone who is different, darker, are somehow a threat to our status quo or our, our well-being. Yeah. And so I, I really, I like that. I like that. Anything else you want to say on that, No, no, no Tyler? No. So now I got a message from, from someone. This is one of our white listeners. And I, and I won't read it. And because it's a question and it was done as a, as a private message, I, I don't want to read it. But it was a very good question. But the essence of it is they've been listening to the show. And um, they're beginning to think really differently um, about race. And it's, it's, a, it's a white male. And, and he basically says, the more I think I understand privilege, um, the more I realize I've got a ways to go. And he and and he wants to be a part of the solution. He wants to be an ally, but he doesn't want to be seen as a white savior. Mm -hmm. And so he sounds stuck. He sounds like I'm being awakened. I feel this um, this push to being a part of the solution. I know it's the right thing. It's not just headiness. It's not just guilt. I'm convinced that this is right. My eyes have been open. But there's this fear that someone's going to say, hey, white guy, why are you trying to be the savior? Mm -hmm. And so he finds himself stuck and so i've learned this by working with white allies through three or four four years of doing our history class that people's immo immobilization is not necessarily due to apathy but it's often due to a fear that they're going to do the wrong thing and until i got to know those people their lack of movement looked like they didn't care mm -hmm. but i think they care too much about making mistakes and in any area of leadership or being a thought leader, a trendsetter, you got to fail. You got to fail quickly. You got to fail often in order to know what you know and what you don't know. But there's so much fear that I hear around my white allies, or as we call them in our history class, would be white allies, that there's so much fear that just immobilizing them. And so, you know, although I can't expect you to speak for all white people or all white men, Tyler, I do have you on the show today so that you can speak for white men <laughs> <laughs> today. Just help me unpack this. A little bit about about wanting to be helpful, but not wanting to be perceived or to feel like a like a savior. We're talking about not feeling like a savior and then not being perceived as a savior, because those are two different things. Sure. How you perceive yourself and your fear of how others perceive you. Sure. Yeah. Do you think maybe some of the apprehension comes from people feeling like they need to act too quickly on what they're learning without? Uh, without giving themselves the grace to just let it marinate and to really be changed by what they're learning? Do you think some of this fear of not wanting to be perceived by a savior is not that hearts are bad, but people just want to move as soon as they begin to see the the light of day? Is, I mean, yeah. is that is that a fair? Yeah, I think so. Because I perception? mean, whenever you see an issue come up or you see something that's wrong or you become awake, I mean, like when, when you start to wrestle with and, and begin to be exposed to like the real injustices that aren't just history, but that have ex extended themselves in today, mm -hmm. which you, your privilege still continues to go. It's almost like you're just like, I have to do something. You, you begin to think, well, what, what do I do? How do I begin to alleviate this? How do I begin to, um, to fix this? Because things swell inside of you and you, you want to, you don't want to be sitting in an uncomfortable mess. You don't want to be sitting in a, a mode of panic or a mode of feeling like, oh, wow, I, I am part of this thing that's awful let's let's so not let's, wanting to feel guilty mm -hmm. i mean is that a part of it oh yeah i mean i i th certainly think that's part of it because your your goal is to um to find a place where you don't have to feel guilty anymore sure where you if i do this act or if i do this well enough or if i um 
uh, if I do what I'm told to do, then I won't feel guilty anymore because sure. I'll do what's sure. supposedly the right thing. Do you remember, um, and this is a tough question because you and I have not processed this, and we said that this will be sort of a live process, although it's recorded, but we know we, yeah. we're we processing this for real. Do you remember the period of time in which the full impact of white supremacy, white privilege, you as a white male, um, you're benefiting of those systems, hit you as a reality, not just a concept or a construct, but do you sort of remember, was it in a classroom? Was it talking with friends? Was it on a walk? Do you remember sort of the, the, the period of time where it just hits you? This is shit. This is real. This mm-hmm. is going on. Mm-hmm. And I've been living for X amount of years, not realizing this happened. I benefit. My family benefit. The people I've grown up around benefit. And we don't even know. Mm-hmm. I mean, do, was that like in college? Was it, it college? It, you know, for me, it's almost been like progressive sure. revelations. It, I bet it's it almost is. like every new space. You sure. Know, you, every new step is a new, uh, every step's an arrival. It's a, sure. That's a quote from um, an author, but like every step's an arrival and being able to continue to like, whoa, okay. Um, so I, I know the beginning stuff was in college where you're just, you're, we had a professor who, he, it, I went to a almost all white school. It's mm-hmm. like probably ninety eight percent white, honestly. Sure. And uh, so his. Did you know any black people in undergrad? I don't. Yes, I knew one. <laughs> you <laughs> knew one. Think about it. You're like, who? Thank God, I knew. Hey, hey, I yes, like, I got right, one. Wait, I got actually, one. You know, you know, There's I my African American. <laughs> started thinking. About, <laughs> that's my that, African American right how, there. That's how all people of color at our school <laughs> always talked about. It, is they always um, felt like. That it, it was, was all uh, white. It was yeah. It, like, <laughs> it was yeah. Yep. Exactly. And so uh, and then yeah, feeling like you're the only person of color in your. <laughs> they in knew your that when they so. applied. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, like that. That was a, a first spot because we had a professor who viewed his life goal at that point was to um, awaken white kids to like what's going on. And he it. was white. Yeah, he was white, and it wasn't just just race. It was sure. almost any aspect of justice that wasn't tied to conservative right-wing um evangelical christian republican party dang you just read you just went down that list that's yeah okay so uh that was your school yeah so that was my school 100 percent. so he kind of played the underground he got let go uh, immediately once we had a regime that came in that was really uh but but um yeah but he he, had to open your eyes and present yeah gotcha and did he do that um through lived experience through history through scripture all through, the above it was through all the above okay and so he, he looked he took a very holistic approach with it we do we had you know different books we read we had different um uh, experiences we did a weekend so a, a lot of it was related to um just so- socioeconomic injustice in general sure. wasn't necessarily just related uh that wasn't just race um that became part of it but socioeconomic wise i remember the moment the first moment that really stuck out to me was he said we started class and he said hey let's do a math experiment and he essentially played out all the statistics and realizations of someone who's trying to work two um, part-time jobs to make ends meet with two or three kids like he just like sure and he was playing into realities of like well you can't get a full-time job because they're not going to give you benefits so uh let's play it out where it's uh you can only work this many hours and then what's minimum wage for this one uh uh let's let's put it together uh okay let's so we just like played this whole math sure. course scenario out um you included the three kids it included the cost of everything when you realize how little because you know a lot of people would just say whether someone's homeless or whether someone's socioeconomically struggling or as a lot of um you know past up would say you know on welfare or something like that so we'll just get a job he played the scenario out to its nth degree and he showed you like that's powerful yeah like you could play it out it, you could get a job or two jobs and work like 16 hours a day with three kids but doing this 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 is and uh is that worth it because we, we we'd sort of like look through the whole thing sure and say, no you're getting screwed um the whole time um and your life yeah so so we, we sort of just played that out and it was it was a good experiment to just be like whoa sure i just remember that just wrecked me because he literally just walked through and like factually deconstructed all my wow. myths that i hey this is eli steenlich the engineer and editor of the black like me podcast and i just wanted to take a moment to tell you about patreon our service that lets you support the show and we know that you all love the show and listen every week 
And so if you want to keep supporting what we do, make sure you go to patreon.com slash black like me. It's never been easier to give to the show and support it. We have a new $2 level, which is cheaper than a cup of coffee. So go ahead and go over to the website, patreon.com slash black like me, and make sure you keep the content coming. And we've already started to do some new things that we're excited about because of the Patreon supporters that we have. So we're going to take you back to the show and back to Dr. G. But thanks for listening. Now, you continue down that journey. It was an awakening for you or um, yep. f- further illumination of an awakening process. But there are others who sat in that class, were in your dorms, ate in the same cafeterias, went to the same chapel, and they said, nah, and didn't really pursue it. Sure. I'm not trying to set it up so that um, you're better, or, but you're certainly different than those folks. What happened in you that... Um, that the root, the seeds took root in the soil of your heart, but there's so many, I guess what I'm saying is the information itself is not magical because there's also got to be this readiness and this openness and this willingness to to change it Mm -hmm. alone or even this is true and I can't fix it or change it Mm -hmm. alone or even in my, uh, in my lifetime. Do you think the people who weren't as um, transformed as you did so because they didn't give a rip or the weightiness, the significance of what they had inherited in terms of benefits, privilege, mm-hmm. access, was too much to wrestle with, too much to let go of, too much to acknowledge, and so they wanted to go back into not thinking about that? Yeah, I, I really can't speak to, I, I don't know what other people wrestle with. I think anything could be an option, you mm-hmm. know, or people do begin to pursue, and then um, you know they're, they're trying to figure out how it impacts or relates to their specific life or mm-hmm. life context. Um, I think for me, I just, became compelled that I was just like, this is, this is stuff that's got to change this stuff. We got to work through. We got to address. We got to like, I gotta, I, I, I gotta do something here. Um, and you want to be part of that, part of that solution. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's no, that's really, it's helpful. Cause I, again, we're trying to, I want to have a, I'm having a discussion with you so that our white listeners are, are getting language to some of what they might be feeling mm-hmm. because I've had many conversations with white men who are not necessarily criers, mm-hmm. but they have cried around this subject because they realize they can't change it. Like yeah. they realize schools they went to are named after slave owners. And I'm not, I don't yeah. necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that all those schools have had got, have their names changed. I think we have to call out the fact that people who wrote documents of supposed freedom who did not practice it for other folks. We've got to call the hypocrisy into order. But I I feel I've talked to enough white men who I think trust me and I have a level of trust and rapport with them. But when they look back and realize so much of what they believe to be honorable and faithful men and exemplary, it becomes really, it becomes overwhelming. And I feel that, White men struggle at a real snapshot of America at 25 Mm -hmm. that black boys have got to wrestle with at 11 in a classroom with what with with white folks. And so I feel like we've got a head start because our parents gave us the talk so we wouldn't be choked out or or blindsided um, or or bewitched by by some of the things that's that's being suggested. But I'm finding that when educated middle class white men are exposed to some of the same realities it's really really hard and as a black person we really couldn't dodge it we could try to ignore it we could say no 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 mom is not that way no 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 dad is not that way it does play out Mm -hmm. that way but we're having to prepare our children for that ugly reality we pull off um we reveal the matrix we 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 tell our kids those things so that it doesn't kill them yeah but for many of our white colleagues, they don't learn that until their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s in a history class. Yeah. And I just, I look in their eyes sometimes and they look bewildered. Like, how could this be? You know, in our history class, I had a, a, a white woman come up to me and say, I'm a history teacher. How did I not learn this? How is it that I have a degree and I went to a good school and no one ever talked to me about reconstruction? No one ever mentioned... Um, Jim Crow. No one ever mentioned the Harlem Renaissance or the Northern Migration, and so I, it, I I watch how this rocks the world or the worlds of many of my white 
colleagues mm-hmm. and it's it's interesting in how they and how they respond and some lean into it like you and they find black mentors and cross cultural experience and they want to learn and grow and they're willing to make mistakes others really don't want to enter into it because it's 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 too painful to live with a reality that they cannot change yeah. and i think one of the things that's endemic within our western culture is that we want to check things off we want to get things we want to get these things finished, and so I guess to to this person's question, like they said, I want to be an they said I want to be an ally, but I want to I want to make sure that my motives are right. Yeah. I think I want to say to someone, and please chime in too, yeah. Tyler. Don't be afraid to take the time to learn to read and 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 build some cross cultural mm-hmm. relationships where you can. Not for the sake of asking questions about what black people are. Asian or Latino people feel about something, but be around them so that you can just learn about how they live their lives, how they raise their families, how they go about their work. But I think it's okay to not feel like you've got to fix everything because one white person is not going to fix this in one white lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it it really is a lifelong continued journey and continued mistakes and continued, you know, working through things because for one, you never, uh, you know, I, I think back to, you would ask me uh, off the air, you know, is there any point um, when I first met you, did you have any white savior in you? Mm-hmm. And I was like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I did. But the point with us is that no one really thinks that they have any white savior in them when they do. Like no one's going around and going, oh yeah, I do this because I'm a white savior. Right. Like, like we're all, we, pretty much we all start there. That That's sort of the... And define white savior as you think about it. So like thinking like like you are the one that is going to help and make things better. And you're the one that's going to help um, a lot of times arrogantly in a way that in others won't or in others. But the, the, the basic example that a lot of people use is uh, uh, that people highlight these days is, you know, missionary trips that people go on or service mm-hmm. trips where, uh, you know, white people go in, take pictures with um, uh black kids post them on their instagram right. post them on this and this and be like look what i did today hey, i'm hanging out with tayshawn yeah look at that he's a great kid you know uh blah, blah, blah. and it's like no like you're just trying to come in you you think that you're doing some sort of mentorship help that's going to be helpful or this or that that's not that's not helpful in in all honesty uh you're you're trying to make a situation better by making yourself feel better and making yourself think that you're doing um the good thing uh that's right um but but it's it's not like those are those are some really easy cherry picking ones that you can you can point out you can say i'm you know th- that's how that's what a white savior looks like a sure. white savior looks like this obvious thing but i gotta be honest you it's it's a continual process of trying to diagnose what that looks like and sure. how does that look like um that's, that's for real that's real that's real talk yeah because you know for me um you know, i've been processing through this a lot lately uh working through it it's like so I, you know, I feel like awakening happened, mm-hmm. you know, a long time ago and you keep, you keep building and you keep growing and you keep uncovering things and deconstructing things. But one of the things that has been interesting lately that I've been thinking about is I feel like, you know, I've kind of jumped in mm-hmm. with stuff. I, I moved here. I, I, I've jumped in cross-culturally and everything, but it's almost like I feel like my identity I've been trying to build in my life, this, you know, has been white ally. Mm -hmm. Like that's my identity. Like not even necessarily just Tyler or like, how does Tyler, you know, engage with this? But like my identity has been found in if I am the perfect white ally Mm -hmm. or not. Right. And so I feel like for especially a lot of more social justice leaning or more people who are really trying to pursue this and almost sense that, guilt or shame or sure. participation we we're running from it and we're, we're we're leaning in so hard and trying so hard to be the the white ally that we think we have to be because in some ways we think well if i don't do it what's going to happen or like i got i it's you, you put all this pressure on yourself that if i'm not the white ally that i have to be uh well what what happens like what what do i do with myself like how do i you know all of that so it's it's almost like this yeah like i'm i'm wrestling through a white savior nature that appears in a less pictures on instagram look 
to uh-huh. me and it appears more like do i really think that my identity is purely found in being the white ally because that has its own ramifications i think as uh, well. sure it sure does and it, it puts you at odd sometimes with people in your own community in your own white community yeah. where they might feel like well you're looking down on us or mm-hmm. you have these cross-cultural relationships and i don't and you know black people and i don't mm-hmm. and um yeah, I, I could see where that would have its own its own downside. So, yeah. I mean, so what I hear you saying is it's a continual process, which yeah. for white males, white Western males, that that's tricky. And that's also a male thing. So that's not just on whites. We like to check things off. We like to feel like, yeah. okay, we did it. We did it. We yeah. got all these things done. I raked the lawn. I, I did this. I bagged the leaves. I went grocery shopping. I changed the oil. I can now chill. I can watch the game and relax. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm caught up. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. And I think in people's minds, particularly white individuals, they may go 20 for you, you know, 20 years, your entire life up until that point, thinking the world is one way. Then you have these new realities crashing in. Well, you want to stop the crashing. You don't want to feel like that every day. And you can't imagine that you need to feel that way every day. And so if your identity is to be this white ally that makes stuff perfect, you, you you know, you just really you damage yourself. I mean, I've been married 32 years. I'm not the perfect husband. I've been a dad for almost 23. I'm not the perfect dad. Yeah. I'm not the perfect pastor, but it's a work in progress and I'm committed to it. I know that it's a part of um, a part of what I need to do. Yeah. And so I think people have to begin to understand at least two things. Um, I see some people who suffer from the white savior complex downplay the real issues Mm -hmm. because that will make it stop. I mean, people used to tell women, stop making your husbands angry and then you won't suffer from domestic violence. It's you're somehow causing it. You blame the victim. So put your seatbelt on, you know, who is this? Franklin Graham said, just put your hands up Mm -hmm. and then the police won't shoot your sons. That's asinine. Yeah. But it's blaming the victim. It's just basically putting it back on you and saying, you're the blame for this. We don't need to talk to officers because you know, they have absolutely zero issues. But parents who are not teaching their children to obey the law, it's 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 all on on them. So let's tell people to change their behaviors and then the world will change for them. Get good grades, raise your hands, mm-hmm. um, sign up for social clubs at school without taking into consideration the reality of what's what's really going on. When I when I first started in this work, Tyler, many good, many well-intentioned white friends from progressive Madison often tried to talk me out of my real issues Mm -hmm. because that was the only way they knew to um, alleviate the discomfort of Mm -hmm. the reality of that. I talked about the first time I've been pulled over by the police. um, You know, this is about 20, 25 years ago. And um, this woman in this training raised her hand and she said, you know, my husband was driving to Kansas city and he has his 57, whatever. And um, the police thought he was a drug dealer because the police told me I fit the profile of a drug dealer. And um, and she told the whole story. People were nodding their heads because what she was trying to say is that it's not just a black thing. So I said, when your husband got out of the car, did they still think he was a drug dealer? Yeah. And she said, no. And I said, why did you feel the need to say that in this group? Why did you feel the need to say that to me? She said, because the painfulness of that being your reality made me so uncomfortable that I tried to do something to shift it. But who does that help? Does it help a room of white people to think that this happens to everybody if you just drive a nice car? No, my car was a Nova. It was not a nice car. It was new to me. I just finished college, so I bought it. But it wasn't a souped-up, tinted um, thing with you know with spinners on it. Um, and nor should that matter. Yeah. If I'm not dealing drugs, what makes me look like a drug dealer at 10 a.m. in a black suit going to take pictures for my church? What about me looks like a drug dealer or fits the profile of a drug dealer? Yeah. And so we've got to watch the saviors who weren't listening to you. People stop being angry, pipe down. This is why people aren't listening to you. Um, and they feel like that's their role, that if they could just build a relationship to try to tell people how to be sincere, you've got to shut down everything that seems racist and, and, and insincere and unjust. you got to confront every loved one at every family gathering. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then you don't get a chance just to let people see your real relationships and how you're transformed through those relationships. Yeah. And so I guess I want people to know that they can rest. I want, I want this person to know that um, that's asking the question, learn and continue to learn because, you know, as we talk about with transformational leadership, the greatest impact that you're going to have is out of what you learned mm-hmm. and being a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. And so just let that new information saturate you, um, reflect upon it, process with other people who look like you. I find that many of my would be white allies 
want to learn something and they want to practice it in their black friends. They want to practice this new language without really understanding. They may not want to talk to you about race right now because it's dinner time. They're just trying to eat a slice of pizza. They don't want to talk about issues of race. They might just be at church on Sundays because they need to pray and they need that time with God and they don't want to be cornered and to be, and to be asked about race. So I think that it's, I think that it's okay to learn. But then I think the other thing is it comes down to relationships. And so I would encourage this person um, and many people are living in communities that are almost like you talked about your college where there's almost no black people there, mm-hmm. but you've got to find a professional association. You've got to find a church. You've got to find something that's other yeah. that you can learn how to become a part of because it's not until you're really in those spaces and really building meaningful relationships um, that it will really crystallize what you can do to be a part of the solution. I mean, do, do you think that that's fair to say? Yeah, I mean, because a lot of time we talk about, you know, one or the other. Yeah, we, we talk about challenging systems, but I mean, we've talked about this before. Like, how do you challenge systems if you don't have any understanding of what's actually going on mm-hmm. in people's real lives uh, and, and why people think certain things different ways? Right. Um, so, so you got to you got to be in relationship with people to know their know what they actually want and what they actually are looking for uh, and be able to. Yeah, without having to sit down at a coffee meeting and ask, what do you think about race? Right. You're going to hear that if you're in relationship with people without needing to right. find the, find some interview time to make it happen. Sure. You know I mean, sure. So, and I think people have, have got to take time to process the propaganda that they're being filled mm-hmm. or being fed as well. For example, um, people might want to talk about, um, uh, race or racism with me as a black person, but they haven't, processed how do they feel when they go to their to their child's college or high school basketball game and there's a black kid or white kid that's kneeling during the national anthem and and what do they do to not perceive those as anti-american anti-militaristic folks um I think people have to take the time to understand how much they've been fed some of these things to think a way a particular way about systemic realities so that they're only left to serve poor, young, destitute people who need a sandwich, a handout, an apartment, a backpack, school supplies, but they're not handled, they're not, they have not prepared themselves to understand the true issues like, why can't someone like Colin Kaepernick play in the, in the NFL? Mm-hmm. Why is it that in the state of Wisconsin, because he was born in Wisconsin, why is it that when the state legislature put forth a resolution to honor African Americans during Black History Month, um, it was shot down unless his name was taken out of it. Mm. Now, I was one of those honored in there in, in that document, and I really appreciate it. But how do you have white people telling black people who they can honor as their heroes? And so the state of Wisconsin, uh, as really the Republican side of the House, would not approve a Black History Month resolution because it states in it, Folks like Alex G, blah, 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 Sheila Stubbs, blah, 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 Colin Kaepernick, who was born in Wisconsin. They were told, unless you take his name out, we will block it and we will not have this resolution. So what folks need to do to be a part of the solution is to understand how did we get there? Mm -hmm. And how do the people who speak up for these things become deemed as a threat to our democracy or anti anything when they're really trying to make America all that it really can be. And so, um, and these, these are things that I think white people have to talk to white people about. Yeah. I mean, this person can talk to someone black and well, how do you feel when you see someone taking the knee, ask your white friends, ask your cousins, ask your dad, ask your brother, ask your brother-in-law, ask your niece, how do they feel and how do they get to the place where these people hate America mm-hmm. and they hate the military and they're anti-police? Mm-hmm. So I think there's so much unpacking and learning that would-be white allies could do, but it's processing those painful images and asking those difficult questions that helps a person to be an ally because an al- I think a white savior is a person who wants a quick fix. Yeah. For theological reasons, I don't like that because, you know, anyway, I won't even get into that because certainly it was not a quick fix with 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 our Savior. But it's not a quick fix, but it's really the dismantling of those systems that makes a person a true ally and a true advocate. Mm-hmm. And so if your goal is to feel better, is to alleviate guilt mm-hmm. 
or to think that you can actually end it in your lifetime yep. so that you can sl- breathe better, sleep better, and not feel any responsibility or culpability for acting within your own spheres of influence, you've missed the opportunity of what it means to really be a true ally. Mm-hmm. And so I think people act too quickly and we need to take the, we need to take the time to learn. So like people who are listening, like this gentleman who's listening and asking a question, I respect him tremendously because mm-hmm. I feel like if we get one message from him, there's 50 others who are thinking this. But what he doesn't realize is he's stuck in thinking, okay, the more I understand, the more guilty I feel or the heavier I feel mm-hmm. that feeling traumatized by the racial history of our country is what a black man feels every day of his life. Yeah. And wrestling under this weight might be the closest this man comes to understanding how I feel as a black man, because I can't change it, I can't fix it, mm-hmm. I can't make people not see the color of my skin, I can't help, I can't stop people's preconceived notions, I can just work at being excellent, present, respectful, and thorough. Mm-hmm. But some of what I think white people try to shake, the feelings that they try to shake, gives them a glimpse of what people of color are shrouded with every day, and they've got to shake it off and still be a supervisor, a manager, an entertainer, a pastor, a civic leader, um, and check their own emotions Mm -hmm. in order to try to make themselves, their families, and their communities better places. And so I would say to, to my white friends who are listening, if you're trying to shake the feelings or the weightiness of privilege as you listen to us or television or news, you might want to just let it that feeling stay there for a moment because it's really the lack of comfort and fear that makes us bring about change and not comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's heavy because people, I think that's why people after history class, Tyler will say, tell me what to do. Yeah. Because if they can just show up and do a task, they're helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they can be really, they can be really helpful. But again, if you have not processed how we got to where we are and your role in this and how you've benefited from it or benefit from it, you can't be helpful yet. Yeah. And so I think you learn and when you're ready, the opportunities will present themselves. But I just, I would just say to this person, really continue to learn, continue to look inside and have meaningful relate discussions with people who look like you mm-hmm. about these issues. And, and I think that that's where it starts and then begin to ask yourself, well, what can I do to be a part of the change yeah. and then begin to, you know, to research that, um, to look into that, to ask questions yeah. around that. But I love the fact that people are committed enough to listen and to ask the questions. And I'm hoping that in some of the discussion today yeah. that is giving them some, some insight. But as an African-American, I want it to be seen as a leader who needed to be developed and not some problem that needed to be fixed. Yeah. I didn't want someone just to look at me and assume um, I knew what I needed. If you just took the time to ask me, yeah. I could tell you I need this, I need that, and this would be really helpful. So when people think for me and speak for me and act on my behalf, it's it's insulting because you don't know me. You haven't taken time to get to know me or my issues, and now you're making proclamations, you're making laws, you're making decisions, you're making rules on my behalf. Yeah. And that usually happens at the hands of the most enlightened, yeah. woke and progressive white folks. Mm-hmm. Cause it's mostly just because they've identified it, um, as an issue, not as a, almost like an issue, not a reality or mm-hmm. an issue, not mm-hmm. real people's experience. Sure. Um, and so it's much easier to solve real people's issues, uh, or it's much easier to solve issues with like legislature and like this or that or policies and this and that, which obviously we were, sure. were like trying to, you know, do and all that sort of stuff. But when it's just an issue and it we're not solving it through knowing people's experience. No, that's so and true. And all of that, that's where you can build this idea that I can fix it. Sure. Instead that's, of I I can't fix your experience. Right, right. And I I would just say as we as we're wrapping up, I know you gotta get back to some other some other duties I've gotta I've gotta get on to um to thinking about um, you know, the next upcoming episodes. But I wanna say when I talked with African Americans one of the things that we wish our white colleagues would do would, is to talk to their children about these issues. Yeah. Because what's happening is, you know, I'm going to go out there and just say this. Donald Trump was someone's child. 
um, the folks in in um, Charlottesville, the guys leading that march, um, you know, singing blood and soul. Those are someone's sons. I have to believe that someone didn't have the talk yeah. with them. Just like I have to believe Brock, whatever his name is, who the swimmer out at um, Stanford, Stanford, I think, who raped that young lady, that somehow his dad did not have the talk with him because he said, well, hasn't he suffered enough? And so I want to say, I want to say this with, with, with real sincerity, um, that a mistake that I think would be white allies make is that they want to talk with people of color about what they've learned about racism, but they don't want to talk to their relatives Mm -hmm. about it. Um, it was not black people who voted in Donald Trump. It was white people who didn't talk to their sisters, mothers, husbands, wives, but they wanted to lament with black people mm-hmm. because we could say, yeah, this sucks, but didn't want to talk to the other folks. And that's tough. And I'm not saying point a finger and call them names, but parents, my parents had to talk to me. My mom had to talk to me and give me the talk. Um, folks have got to talk to them and say, talk to me about your friends. Talk to me about your perceptions of people from different ethnic backgrounds talk to me about what your friends say about friends from different backgrounds Mm -hmm. because if you don't if you don't start addressing that and saying now in our family in our house this is not how we talk or think you don't have to have black people around to say the right to say the right things Mm -hmm. you know you need water to learn to swim i mean some things are necessary but you don't have to have a house full of black people to learn to be loving just and fair you want people to be ready For when they get to that place, astronauts train in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. but they don't train on the moon. They train in a simulated environment so that they're ready when they go out. We have to make our homes those simulated um, Mm -hmm. environments so that when our kids are interacting, they're not afraid to say hello, to make friends, to talk differently. Because if we don't talk to if our white allies don't talk to their children and they're just assuming because they're just good natured, they're going to get caught up with other good natured kids who become um, what's what's the word? radicalized, mm-hmm. and if you, once you start telling someone that's the other, that's the enemy. Mm-hmm. They're trying to take our stuff. They're trying to take our girls, and you know they they you know they're trying to take our starting spots. They're trying to they're trying to take our jobs. It doesn't take long to feed into that fear and to then raise another generation. I don't think America can have can afford another generation of radicalized white folks and disenfranchised black people because eventually. We're going to see more clashing. We're going to see more ugliness. We're going to see more bloodshed. Um, And I'm afraid of what's coming down the road. And we're wanting to talk to black people and not wanting to talk to white children we brought into this world or white parents who brought us into this world. And I think that that's that that that's a real important piece. Again, continue to do that work and continue to know that that's important so that you're ready to build those cross-cultural relationships. But don't feel overwhelmed Mm -hmm. because you're not changing the world today. Mm -hmm. Because if you're transformed, Mm -hmm. you can then, and only then, can you transform the world around you. Yeah. Tyler, thanks for sitting in here. I know um, we were having this dialogue. I kind of got on my soapbox and I did more talking um, than than you have. But, um, man, we've got about 70 episodes up, and you've been a part of each one of those. And... um, you're learning and asking questions and, and hopefully not, you're not trying to be perfect in this cross culture work. You're very open when I say, Hey, you might want to watch this or consider this. But, um, but I appreciate that we can have this discussion because we have a, you know, 30 year difference in age yeah. thereabout. Um, we grew up in different places that are not necessarily that far from each other, but we also learn from each other. And I, I like for you and I to have a talk on, you know, on the air because I want people who are listening to understand that one is white men. You can have a black mentor yeah. and we don't just I don't just mention you about life stuff. We talk I mean about black stuff. We talk about life and a whole you know, a number of things. But I appreciate the fact um, that you're willing to be vulnerable with your flat sides. And you're also willing to help me nudge would be white allies along because this is important work. And I don't want to lose anyone along the way who really wants to be part of the process. So I feel that when you and I are talking, it gives people a sense that people can laugh and joke and have fun with each other and talk about other things than just racial issues. So I'm hoping that we're modeling things so people have a different perception of what this could look like when they put years and years and years into um, into relationship building. So yeah. thank you for the work that you do as my podcast manager and the work that you're doing in the community. Um, 
and in our church and um, and for willing to think hard about these issues and to bear your soul to folks who look like me and to folks who look like you in order to help me really build better, better bridges. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. This has been another great episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. Thank you so much for listening in. And as always, we really want you to listen. We want you to learn. We want you to share. We want you to subscribe. And please click the link and go to our Patreon page. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holiday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Thank you.